burping them all. Yep. Come on, man. Give me a little burp. That one smells like cheeseburgers. <laughs> So I'm meeting up today with my friends, Frank Ippolito and Jimmy DeResta. And what better place for Make Your Minds to Assemble than Frank's shop, Finger G Inc. here in Burbank. Hey, how you doing? So here's my shop. You've been here before. It's amazing. It's always fun. These are the body parts? Yeah, we're gonna make some body parts like this. It looks like uh, Jimmy's already in the mold shop. Let's go head back. Hi, I'm Frank. This is my shop, Finger G. We build props and costumes for the film industry. And this is actually just the mold shop. We can't really shoot in the main shop right now because we're working on a bunch of shows. So we're stuck over here today. Yeah, tourists. <laughs> we're told tourists, that's the cool thing. So why do you use warm water? Uh, it makes it go a little faster. If you use cold water, it takes a little longer. It's more about the amount of water that you put in. If you put in too much water, then it'll be a really low viscosity mix and there'll be less bubbles. But if you don't put in enough, it's real thick. And there'll be a lot of bubbles in there. So what exactly is alginate? Do we know? It's a naturally occurring anionic polymer. Anionic polymer? Are you making this up as you go? No, it's true. What's cool is that um, depending on the species of algae, you get different gel abilities. So what does all that mean? Let me explain. I told Jimmy that alginate is a naturally occurring anionic polymer. An anionic polymer is simply a negatively charged chain of repeating molecular units. In alginate's case, it's a type of polymer scientists call a polysaccharide, meaning it's a long chain of small sugar units. Now I said alginate is naturally occurring material because it's extracted from the cell walls of brown marine algae, like kelp and rockweed. Alginate provides those seaweeds with a flexible structure that protects them from injury when they're subjected to strong water motions like waves and ocean currents. Now different parts of the seaweed plants, as well as different types of seaweed, will contain different kinds and amounts of alginate in their cells. These differences are based on the proportions of different types of sugar within the alginate, which affects how strong of a gel it can form. Some seaweeds produce an alginate that has a high viscosity when dissolved in water, meaning it's thick and gooey. Other alginates create a low viscosity or thinner fluid. Now, all of this affects its workability and what kind of applications it can be used for. The diversity of alginate makes it an incredibly versatile substance. When scientists and makers work together using this stuff, they're able to make everything from dental molds to rubber hands. Isn't that pretty awesome? Let's see how to actually use this alginate stuff. So now this is where we should get a, a fun face this way. <laughs> 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 All right, there you go. Get our, th our thumbnail. Pro tips that, that you know because you've been doing it for a long time, but that maybe someone getting into it wouldn't know right away, like some cheats or... You smear the alginate on whatever it is that you're molding first. It kind of helps get into the details and get into the nooks and crannies before you just dunk it right into the bucket. Because if you were to just dunk it straight into the bucket, there's a chance that you might catch a bubble, you know, like in a fold on your hand or, or somewhere like that. Like what kind of, like what does that feel like? Tapioca, I guess? I don't know. Tapioca? Like a yogurt. Yeah, it's oh, like that pudding. actually, it's I like, mean, as a gel, tapioca kind yeah. of expands similarly. Like, so. a, like a pudding or something? Oh. So if you're molding something like your hand and one hand is in a bucket where you can't see it, it's always good to kind of mirror what you're doing with the other hand. It's kind of like rubbing your belly and patting your head. If you're kind of doing the same thing with both hands, it kind of will naturally go into the correct position that you want. You know, do it with both hands, and then the one that you're not looking at won't start doing something weird. You guys are so tall. Getting Frank's head off. No, it's not cut off anymore. How tall are you? I am five foot and a half inch, because a half inch is all I got of my mama. <laughs> <laughs> So algin has been around in the industry for a long time. For ages, we would do head casts and body casts and stuff with it too. Now there's silicones that we use. I think the last time I did an algin at life cast was 2003. We just use silicones. They're just better for doing face casts and head casts and stuff like that. But for things like doing arms, like it's easier just to fill a bucket full of alginate and stuff your hand in there 
Because if I was to do it with silicone, I'd have to like brush on a bunch of layers and then make a mother mold and all this other, it just takes so much time. You know, it's, it's always one of those things like, what is your time worth? How long does it normally take to set up? This stuff says eight minutes, yes. um, depending on the temperature of water, but this water is a little on the cold side. So, oh, I can feel it start, see it starting to gel on my hand here. Oh yeah, yeah. Tell me, why does it gel? Why does it gel? Yeah, come on, it's... science girl, tell us. <laughs> science girl here, time for another deep dive. In order to make this a substance that can hold its shape, manufacturers add salts that contain calcium to the dry alginate, and then we added water. That's what kicked off that curing process. Think of the polymers in alginate like little pieces of string. When you add water, the strings are free to move around. When the calcium salt mixes with water, it releases positively charged calcium ions that are then attracted to the negatively charged alginate polymer that we talked about earlier. Now those calcium ions act like glue between those polymer strings, bonding them together. This gluing is taking place though on a microscopic level, but it is what produces the final three-dimensional flexible alginate structure that we like to call a gel. Now notice that I said it's the calcium ions and polymers binding together. This jelly matrix does not chemically bond the water into the system. Instead, it just mechanically retains the water sort of like a sponge. So over time, the water will slowly leak out, causing the alginate mold to shrink, similar to the way seaweed does in the sun. Also like seaweed, the type of water the alginate is in can drastically affect its functionality. This is because water can also contain other minerals and salts like the calcium ions we needed to form the matrix. As a result, Frank has to be aware of the mineral content of the water he's using because it can affect the physical properties or the curing time of the alginate. If you go too thin, it'll be a, a weak mold and it'll rip easily. If you go too thick, you'll get too many bubbles and won't get your detail. So you just gotta find that happy medium. Now some other factors that affect alginate curing speeds and thus how long Frank can work with the material are the temperature of the water, the ratio of water to powder, and even environmental factors like the humidity of the room and the electrical conductivity of the bowl he mixes in. Altering these parameters allows Frank to tailor the alginate's properties to the project at hand. All right, puns and science are done. Let's get back to the shop. Not every alginate is uh, compatible with the platinum silicones. And this one from SmoothOn is specifically formulated to be able to put the platinum silicones into. Most of what we use for doing this kind of stuff is platinum-based silicones. They're just, they stay around longer, they don't break down quite as fast, and they're, they have better uh, physical properties. You can make body parts out of other things. You can make them out of latex and polyfoam and all these other, there's a, there's a ton of ways to make you know fake body parts. This just happens to be the one that is quickest and easiest. I also love that you're saying silicone is the best and you got silicone right behind your head. Totally stuck in that hand position. I could like let go of my muscles because I've been holding my muscles in like that back bend. Definitely felt strained, but I mean, I'm gonna live. I think I'm gonna be fine. Extra love. Here you go. So there's no issues with hair either. No, no the hair pulls right out. We could probably mold your face with your beard the way that is and get your face. No. And then it would just it'd, it'd tug a little bit, but you yeah. could pull it right. Jimmy, be honest, did you flip the bird in there or <laughs> is it <laughs> is it a regular hand? <laughs> I mean, we could, we could go on for like hours and hours about different silicone types and, and how that how the tins differ from the platinums and every, you know, all the things that inhibit silicones, but that's another video. Getting the volume right is sometimes hit and miss. Sometimes I'll make too much or too little. If I'm doing it all the time, then I can hit it like every time, like just the right amount. But if I haven't done it in months, sometimes I make either too much or too little. So, you know, mistakes are kind of how we figure out how to do these things. And that's how I learned. And I still make mistakes all the time. Like it's just part of making stuff. So is there like an ordering to it? Like you're starting with B, is that the, um, the pro, pros no? no normally you put the pigment into the B side. And that's like kind of a rule we have here at the shop too. If there's a jar of silicone on the shelf and it's got pigment in it, it's always side B. You know, if you're just trying to make body parts, just getting like the, like whatever clo is closest to the flesh tone you want to make, um, get that and then get a couple of things to maybe adjust it. Maybe a blue, maybe a green, maybe a white. That's typically what I use when I'm doing lighter flesh tones. You know, it all depends on, on what, what colors you're trying to nail. Man, you are way better at this. I was making brownies last night and I did not have that kind of skill trying to mix that in. 
<laughs> Actually, I think I want to add some white to this. Yeah, that makes sense. I'm pretty pasty. Using the greens and the blues to kind of adjust the, the peachy tones. It's all about like color theory and like what you see with your eye. It's color theory, guys. You add a little bit of green to counteract the, the reds. Fun fact that that green counteracting the orange is why you use a green when you have pimples to cover up the redness. Oh, really? So like it's the weirdest thing. Like women have concealer that's just green goo, but it like you put that on first and then you put the nude concealer on and you don't see the redness with the pimples. Because the concealer itself can't cover the red. Not that this helps you guys at all, but in case you were wondering. Forget that I was a makeup artist for the first like, oh, yeah. 15 years <laughs> I was in Los Angeles. So... So I guess I'm woman explaining to you, huh, Frank? <laughs> well, you don't want to you don't want to go with the redness in there. I want to go with like some of the lighter tones in there, mm -hmm. and then when you paint it, you paint the, the reds into it. Oh, right. So for painting silicone, for doing anything with silicone, the only thing that sticks to silicone is more silicone. So you have to paint it with a with a silicone based paint. Once you take it out of that mold and you clean it off, you can use some alcohol or naphtha or whatever you want to do. Then you can paint it with a two part catalyzed like silicone. So you're mixing the A and B, just like what we did here. But you have to do that within the first, I don't know, like two or three days, because once that silicone finishes cross-linking, it's not gonna bind to that new silicone as well. Yeah, yep. paint, paint silicone more silicone. Wow, man, you really nailed it. Look at that, 1800, that's all I got left in there. <laughs> <laughs> you nailed it. Burping the mold. Yeah. Come on, man. You look for it. So when you're rolling this, you said to get the bubbles out? Yeah, in case there's like a little bubble trapped in, in the fingers or anything. Pinch the butt, pinch the butt, pinch the butt. Whoa. There we go. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and once, I, once I paint it, you won't see all those little bubbles on there. Yeah. It's just under the surface. Oh, it's still kind of wet. <laughs> How many hands could you make out of a single mold? Um, I've been able to pull like six or seven out of there if you're careful. And do you get as fine a details in each iteration? At some, at some point it'll start softening. Be great, put a, put a ring on it. <laughs> Yeah, if I had used warm water, it would kick off a little bit quicker. So this is just going to take a little bit longer. So it just means you got to sit there longer. I like it. You know, you you found the one way to keep me still. <laughs> we'll have to do your uh, your head sometime, and then it'll be a way to keep your, your mouth shut. Oh, I see what you did there. I see what you did. I'm one of those people that I'm like I'm not I'm not claustrophobic, but then I'm like the thought of like only having a single air hole like for your tiny nostrils, it kind of scares me. I mean, I've done hundreds of life casts before, so, and nobody has died. No, it's, they're, they're all still alive. Everybody's still alive. Oh. There you go. Nice. So if you're doing, say, like, a body part of a famous actor for a piece, like, do you just have them come in and you take a bunch of photos, or? It really helps if you could do, like, the final touches with the person there, but good photos. Um, you know, if you get good color balance photos, you're fine. Look, I made too much. This is how you give a facelift. You just pull it a little tighter. I just gotta get a grip on it. There you go. <laughs> oh my gosh, look how tiny my hand is. Man, my hands have gotten real wrinkled as I've aged. <laughs> well, you're also... Oh look, I chipped a nail. Hmm. This is not so gross. Oh, I can hold my own hand. It's love. I'm just gonna hold this for you. So you see how there's all those bubbles on the back side of your hand? Yes. Um, there's a way that I can get rid of those. Here, I'll show you. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put it in a vacuum chamber. So what this does is it's, it's sucking out all the air inside of this chamber and it sucks all the air that I just mixed into the silicone from stirring it and now it'll collapse on itself. So that's how you know that you've got all of the air out of the thing. So I needed to put it in a bigger container so that it has that room for expansion. Because this silicone only has a six minute work time, I have to go quick. My hand is so small compared to Jimmy's. Jimmy's got a big, big beefy hand. 
How about that? <laughs> it was a, is it moist? <laughs> So there's this thing I like to do to celebrate the end of an episode, but we're gonna have to go outside for it. Okay. Okay, you can throw an off there. Two, three. Whoa! That was, that was way better. <laughs> Whoa! Yeah. All right.